Recently, Jordan Peterson invited a Muslim scholar to his podcast. His name is Muhammad Hijab. The goal of this video is to analyze what was said. I will divide my evaluation into three categories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's start with the good. I think it was great that Jordan Peterson invited a Muslim. We need more discussion and less prejudice. I think it's good that the Muslim guest, Muhammad Hijab, is a traditional Muslim. What is a traditional Muslim? Let's hear Hijab describe himself. I'm not sure. Well, look, I'm a traditionalist Muslim, okay, which means I'm orthodox. I, I'm not a liberal at all. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I oppose liberalism, to be quite honest with you, in, in the sense that I criticize it. I don't think it's the truth with a capital T. Uh, I don't, so a lot of Enlightenment ideas, I oppose them openly, right? And so I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who is a traditionalist Muslim. Someone, and by that I mean I stick to the Quran and the Sunnah, which is the prophetic sayings, and the jurisprudential tradition, which is derived from those two sources and other sources as well. But this is a traditionalist perspective, which I think represents the majority. Why is that good? Because so-called liberal Muslims, despite their claims, do not adhere to the fundamentals of Islam. These fundamentals are important, not only because the majority of Muslims believe in them, but because this is a solid basis for any discussion about Islam. Liberal Muslims simply omit certain texts or interpret them as they see fit. So we end up with uh, individual versions of Islam every time. So it is good that we have a traditional Muslim here. What else? Uh, Muhammad Hijab is a scholar of religion, born and raised in the uh, UK. Uh, he has several master's degrees and he's currently uh, working on his uh, doctoral thesis. And um, he's a charismatic and a well-spoken man. Uh, that's it for the good stuff. Uh, let's move on to the bad now. Um, it is unfortunately always the, the same pattern um, when Muslims discuss with Westerners. Although the discussion is mainly about Islam, the Muslim will always put on uh, the deist's hat. A deist with a D. The Muslim will also bring Christianity and sometimes Judaism into the discussion. And if the Muslim is, is, is pushed into a corner and forced to defend Islam, he will do a lot of cherry picking. We will see very good examples of this um, in the video clips that I, I'm, I'm going to show you. Well, if you're saying that God has made uh, the universe in this way, then your God, who's more complicated, and he would add this layer of complexity, yes, yes, yes. Uh, this, your God is more complicated, would require an even greater, he would require an even greater explanation. Really a greater God. Yeah, yeah. So really interestingly, Anthony Kenny, who, who's um, an agnostic himself, he's a philosopher and agnostic, he came in and he said, well, actually, take a look at this. You've got an electric razor, which is made up of many different component parts. And you have a cutthroat razor, which is made up of one part. And he said, although the, the electric razor is more complicated, it's, it serves less functions than the cutthroat razor, because the cutthroat razor can cut your throat and it can also cut an apple, for example. And, and so it's, it's a fallacy to assume that just because something is complicated or that something has many features and attributes, that that thing itself uh, requires an explanation. We saw here a very good example of what uh, I call a, a false debate. Uh, here, Hijab is, is playing the deist card. He's, he's trying to, to prove the existence of some universe cause. Um, all these attempts have nothing to do with the actual podcast topic. Um, I, I call this a false debate because this leads to nothing. Um, even if uh, if an atheist is convinced that uh, there is a cause of the for the universe, any cause, um, in in his life, uh, nothing will change. Um, there is there is no difference in real life between an an atheist 
and a, a deist with a D. Uh, but there are big differences in, in, uh, in religion between believers and unbelievers. I understand, though, why uh, theists like uh, hijab play this role. Uh, first, they, they, they don't need to, to expose themselves uh, to criticism of, of their religion. And second, they, they make themselves sympathetic by taking the same position as other believers. Uh, they make their, their team bigger. Team uh, deists versus team atheists. Is that this would disqualify something like the Trinity from being true. And in fact, the Quran, this is the Islamic position, uh, is vehement in its uh, opposition towards a triune God. So, for example, in chapter uh, 23, verse 91, it says, <laughs> That God hasn't taken a son and he doesn't have any gods with him. If that had been the case, each God would have taken what he has created and they would have tried to dominate one another. The idea, therefore, that there can be more than one all-powerful entity is an inconceivable and unintelligible idea from the Islamic paradigm. So it's seen as um, problematic, to say the least, or conceptually impossible, to say even more, to suggest that something like a trinity can be true. When it's talking about, for example, Mary and, jo uh, Mary and Jesus, it says something very simple. That both of them used to eat food. So in other words, the impossibility of something limited like Jesus, a man, being God at the same time, being unlimited. Because the definition of God is that he's unlimited. Is, is, is... Here, uh, hijab jumps to the triune uh, doctrine in, in Christianity uh, to show that Islam is a pure monotheistic religion. What hijab does not mention, however, is that the Quranic understanding of, of Christianity, of, of the Christian Trinity, is totally wrong. In, in the Quran, the Holy Spirit is not mentioned at all as part of the Trinity. Worse, the Quran thinks that Mary is a part of it. The verse reads, the Messiah, son of Mary, was no more than a messenger. Many messengers had come and gone before him. His mother was a woman of truth. They both ate food. See how we make the signs clear to them, yet see how they are deluded from the truth. This is the uh, commentary uh, of uh, Ibn Kathir, um, one of the most uh, famous uh, commentator on the Quran, they both used to eat food, needing nourishment and to relieve the call of nature. Therefore, they are just servants like other servants, not gods, as ignorant Christian sects claim. May Allah's continued curses cover them until the day of resurrection. In 2011, the, uh, the Oxford Anthropological Society They'd done a huge study of 32,000 children. And what they found was that children innately and intuitively, instinctively, have a belief of a higher power of some sort. Now, they're born with that belief. And in fact, in, in one of the uh, papers uh, in, in uh, Justin Barrett's book, he literally mentions the fitrah or the Islamic theological concept of an instinct in believing in God. What's his last name? Barrett. I showed you this clip not to talk about the study, but to show you what the project director, Justin Barrett himself, says about his study. He said, this project does not set out to prove God or God exists. Just because we find it easier to think in a particular way does not mean that it is true in fact. If we look at why religious beliefs and practices persist in societies across the world, we conclude that individuals bound by religious ties might be more likely to cooperate as societies. Interestingly, we found that religion is less likely to thrive in populations living in cities in developed nations where there is already a strong social support network. The, the, the differentiating factor between the Prophet Muhammad and the rest of the Prophets is we believe Whereas all of the other prophets came for their people and their time, we believe that Muhammad came for all people and all times. 
وما ارسلناك yes, well, الا that's certainly what christians say about christ yes but in the bible you'll find up, you know some verses that are saying i've only been sent for the lost sheep of israel yes the verse hijab quotes exists but there are other verses that clearly show that jesus came for all people these verses are ignored by hijab like matthew 26 verse 13 truly i tell you wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world what she has done will also be told in memory of her matthew 28 verse 19 therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit john 1 verse 29 the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The same is true for Muhammad in Islam, by the way. There are verses that indicate that Muhammad came for, for, for the whole world. And there are others that show that he came only for his people. Here are a few of them. And this is a book which we sent down, blessed and confirming what was before it that you may warn the mother of cities, Mecca, and those around it. Another verse says, Indeed, we have made this Quran easy in your own language. O Prophet, so with it you may give good news to the righteous and warn those who are contentious. It is a book whose verses are perfectly explained, a Quran in Arabic for people who know. But what we will say is, there are, we, we would say that there are clear verses in the Bible, like for example, we point to Isaiah 42, 11, where there indicates a new prophet that's going to come. And in fact, Isaiah 42, 11 in particular is extremely important because it even specifies the region. It says it will be sent to the people of Kedar. And the people of Kedar, as in Genesis, Kedar was the son of Ishmael, and basically from him is the lineage of Muhammad, or the Arabs, if you like. And so it is a whole discussion in the whole of Isaiah 42 about a new prophet going to come and he is going to come to the people of Kedar and the people will be rejoicing on the mountaintops. And in fact, the name of a mountain in Medina, which is present day Saudi Arabia, is mentioned, which is the Mount of Sela. And, and so we would say that actually Muhammad was a continuation of Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ as a prophet, uh, also in the Bible, doesn't say that there's not going to be another prophet after me. And so th there's no reasonable reason for us to think at all ended. Well, I think Hijab, like many uh, Muslims before him, is trying here to find the prophet Muhammad in the Bible. It is actually disappointing to see a scholar with his credentials using such mental acrobatics in his Islamic interpretation of the biblical texts. Let us first see what Isaiah 44 verses 1 to 11 says. You can pause the video and read them if you want. According to all commentaries, whether Jewish or Christian, these texts are about the Messiah. Hijab actually changed the wording of, of the text. The word prophet does not appear in the text. The text does not say, I'm sending a prophet to Kedar. Yes, Kedar is the son of Ishmael, and, and, and he lived in Kedar. But what does that have to do with the descendants of Ishmael? Hishab also says that Selah is a mountain in Medina. I, I, I have no idea where, where he got this information from. Here is a map of Selah. The, the real question here is, why, why all these attempts to find the Prophet Muhammad in the Bible? The answer can be found in the following Quranic verse. And remember when Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am truly Allah's messenger to you, confirming the Torah which came before me, and giving good news of a messenger after me whose name will be Ahmad. Yet, when the Prophet came to them with clear proofs, they said, this is pure magic. Yes, you guessed right. Of course, there is no such statement anywhere in the Bible. And Muslims think that the Jewish and, and Christian scriptures have been corrupted 
but they still try with all their might to find any references to their prophet in the Bible. Ahmed Didat was uh, famous for his uh, rather funny uh, interpretations of the Bible and uh, apparently uh, that will never end. Mr. Hijab does the same. I will say the first order of business, Jordan Peterson, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson, is for us, I think, to acknowledge that both religions have a capability of peace. Okay, this is extremely important. And that requires education. So I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. Like, for example, I feel that every time Hijab says, I'll, I'll be honest with you, what comes after is always dishonest. Yes, Islam knows peace, but under what circumstances? Peace in Islam can only be achieved when Islam prevails, when Islam dominates. As long as Islam is subordinated, peace cannot take place. When Muslims are weak, as they are today, peace is not a choice. It is forced upon them. Once Muslims are strong, offensive jihad is activated. Yes, in Islam, there are two types of jihad, defensive and offensive. The offensive jihad is called jihad at-talib. Jihad at-talib. Here is an example of the offensive jihad in the Quran. Fight against those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful and who do not adopt the religion of truth, that's Islam, from those who were given the scripture until they give the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Here what Ibn Kathir, again, one uh, of the main commentaries of the Quran, says about this verse. With willing submission, in defeat and subservience, and feel themselves subdued, disgraced, humiliated, and belittled. Therefore, Muslims are not allowed to honor the people of Dhimma. We're going to talk about the people of Dhimma later or elevate them above Muslims, for they are miserable, disgraced, and humiliated. Muslim recorded from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, do not initiate the Salam to the Jews and Christians. And if you meet any of them in a road, force them to its narrowest alley. This is why the leader of the faithful, Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, demanded his well-known conditions to be met by the Christians. These conditions that ensured their continued humiliation, degradation, and disgrace. The scholars of Hadith narrated from Abd al-Rahman al-Ash'ari that he said, I recorded for Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, the terms of the treaty of peace he con conducted with the Christians of Asham. In the name of Allah, most, most gracious, most merciful, this is a document to the servant of Allah, Umar, the leader of the faithful from the Christians of such and such city. When you Muslims came to us, we requested safety for ourselves, children, property, and followers of our religion. We made a condition on ourselves that we will neither erect in our areas a monastery church or a sanctuary for a monk, nor restore any place of worship that needs restoration, nor use any of them for the purpose of enmity against Muslims. We will not prevent any Muslim from resting in our churches, whether they come by day or night, and we will open the doors of our houses of worship for the wayfarer and passerby. Those Muslims who come as guests will enjoy boarding and food for three days. We will not allow a spy against Muslims into our churches and homes or hide deceit or betrayal against Muslims. We will not teach our children the Quran, publicize practices of shirk, invite anyone to shirk or prevent any of our fa fellows from embracing Islam if they choose to do so. We will respect Muslims move from the places we sit 
in if they choose to sit in them. We will not imitate their clothing, caps, turbans, sandals, hairstyles, speech, nicknames, and title names, or ride on saddles, hang swords on the shoulders, collect weapons of any kind, or carry these weapons. We will not encrypt our stamps in Arabic or sell liquor. We will have the front of our hair cut, wear our customary clothes wherever we are, wear belts around our waist, refrain from erecting crosses on the outside of our churches and demonstrating them and our books in public in Muslim fairways and markets. We will not sound the bells in our churches, except discreetly, or raise our voices while reciting our holy books inside our churches in the presence of Muslims, nor raise our voices with prayer at our funerals, or light torches in funeral processions in the fairways of Muslims or their market. We will not bury our dead next to Muslim dead or by servants who were captured by Muslims. We will be guides for Muslims and to refrain from breaching their privacy in their homes. When I gave these documents to Omar, he added to it, we will not beat any Muslim. These are the conditions that we set against ourselves and followers of our religion in return for safety and protection. If we break any of these promises that we set for your benefit against ourselves, then our dhimma, this uh, promise of protection, is broken and you are allowed to do with us what you are allowed of people of defiance and rebellion. And so that's why it was kind of called Medina after that. In that time period, so you got 13 years of Medina, the vast majority, I'm not going to say all, but the vast majority of wars that took place, in fact, all of the wars that took place before the conquest of Mecca were defensive. So the pagan Arabs went to uh, Medina and tried to siege it. Uh, Badr, Uhud, Ahzab, uh, or the Khandaq, and all of these are names of wars. And in fact, there was, according to Ibn Qayyim, one scholar, there were 19 such wars in 10 years. So that's almost an average of two wars every year. Still, no word on offensive jihad. But let's analyze what Hishab claims anyway. He says that all the wars that Muhammad fought were defensive. Is that true? No. Except for two, all the others were offensive. That means Muslims went to the enemy. Some would argue that these wars were preventive. Even if we accept that, offensive jihad is permitted in Islam. And has always been practiced. Jihad al-Talab, offensive jihad, has two goals. One, wage jihad against non-Muslim territories until they become part of Dar al-Islam, land of Islam, or recognize the authority of Dar al-Islam. Second, reclaim all the lands that were historically part of Dar al-Islam, like Spain, for example. Here's an example of uh, jurisprudence from the famous book of uh, Ibn Rushd Averroes, the distinguished uh, jurist's primer, Bidayat al-Mujtahid wa Nihayat al In section four, the condition for the declaration of war. The condition for the declaration of war by agreement is the communication of the invitation to Islam. That is, it is not permitted to wage war on them unless the invitation has reached them. This is something upon which the Muslim jurists agreed because the words of the exalted, we never punish until we have sent a messenger. So, so the condition, like the, the, the only condition for the declaration of war is to let them, to invite them to Islam. And if they don't accept, you wage war. That's the only condition. They disagreed on whether the repetition of the invitation was required on the recurrence of, of war. Some of them made this obligatory, some considered, considered it desirable, while some of them neither considered it obligatory or nor desirable. So that's the only condition for waging war. So why wage war? In section 7, the, Muslims, the Muslim jurists 
agreed that the purpose of fighting the people of the book, excluding the Qurayshid people of the book and the Christian Arabs, is one of, one of two things. It is either for their conversion to Islam or the payment of jizya. So that's it. That's why we wage war in Islam. Conversion to Islam or the payment of jizya. And look, I'm not saying to you that I know that what Muhammad did was wrong. That isn't what I'm saying. I'm saying that I don't understand how participation in those defensive wars, let's say, but then yes. that was also followed by a tremendous explosion of Islamic expansion, right? The biggest yeah. empire the world had ever seen in a very short period of time, right at, right at Europe's doors. Mm -hmm. And so, and that was also followed by the severance of the Islamic faith into two major categories and, and internecine conflict there. Yes. And so there's that, that stream of, of, of armed conflict activity. Uh, I, I think that you're, uh, with respect, I, I don't think you're getting the history fully right here because well go yep yeah, that's fine go, yeah, go right ahead the the, the, the the war in Jamal and Safin the, the wars between Shia and Sunnah or, or what would then be it's not really between Shia and Sunnah because quite frankly Shiaism had not been established as a but the, the the wars of the companions how many people died in those wars do we have any numbers for maximum we can no, say no but it's but it yeah. fair it's actually too bad that. Uh, Jordan Peterson interrupted hijab here. Uh, I really wanted to hear how many uh, victims have fallen in the wars among Muslims after the death of the Prophet. I'll, I'll get back to you uh, on the numbers, but uh, I just wanted to point out how hijab ignored the first part when Jordan Peterson talked about the extremely rapid Islamic conquest of large areas. He ignored that because he doesn't want to uh, talk about offensive jihad. Okay, le let us now l look at the numbers of inter-Islamic wars in which the uh, Prophet's companions fought against each other. The two famous battles are the Battle of Al-Jamal, the camel, and the Battle of Siffin. Yaqut al-Hamawi al-Baghdadi in his uh, Dictionary of Countries, mentioned 70,000 casualties. This is crazy when we consider that uh, we're, we're talking about an ancient battle with, with, with swords and, and bow and arrow. As for the Battle of Al-Jamal, in which uh, Aisha, the Prophet's young wife, participated, the number of the fallen was 10,000 according to a tabari Look, Sorry. fair enough, man. And it's not like, it, it's, not Christ, it's not like Christianity hasn't been rife with internecine conflict. Yes. No, you know, but the thing but, is... But the fact is, is that it, it was almost immediately after Muhammad's death that this fracturing took place among the people that were closely allied with him. And it was a bloody fracturing. And it isn't yeah, obvious it's not, that it's been how rectified. How bloody was it? How, how bloody was it? We're well, how about... bloody does it have to be? You know, well, it doesn't take you how, much... How, okay. Well, does, Jordan, well, let's, let's be honest. Let's be fair. Yeah, yeah, but okay. Look, Let's be fair, right? With, 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 with the wars that took place 30 to 40 years, and it wasn't immediately after, because you said that in the video, the day he died, that's wrong. He, it didn't happen the day he died. It happened 30 to 40 years after. Here, uh, Hijab knows for sure what Jordan Peterson means. That is the dispute over the succession of the Prophet that took place immediately after his death. But, but Hijab does not want to talk about it. And, and, and honestly, um, I don't know why. Um, the only thing I, I can imagine is that he's reluctant to talk about the death of Muhammad and its relationship uh, to the struggle of power, maybe. I don't know. It happened 30 to 40 years after. And well, we're how talking... long, how, how many people, how many members of Muhammad's immediate family survived during that 30 years? My, my understanding was that most of his immediate family died in armed conflict most of his immediate family died in his own lifetime. Yes. Well, I'm not speaking uh, well, of them, but I'm no, speaking no, look, of what happened after he died. These facts, right? Because yeah. Okay. Look, first, first fact: Muhammad, uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We say sallallahu alaihi wasallam, meaning peace and blessings be upon him. Um, all of his children died in his life. Okay, except for one. So most of the members of his immediate family and his wife died. Khadija died. His uncle Abu Talib died. His other uncle Hamza died. They all died within his lifetime. 
either due to illness or due to uh, some other some other cause, war, for example. This one is actually not that important, but I, I wanted to show you um, how hijab covers, uh, no pun intended, uh, covers some information. Um, he, he always chooses only what's, what, what suits him. Uh, for example, um, yes, Khadija, the first wife of Muhammad, died in his lifetime. But what about the other wives of Muhammad? Um, what about uh, Aisha? Uh, what about Hafsa? Um Salama? Sauda? Uh, Zainab? Juwayriya? Um Habiba? Safiya? Maymuna? Like one of the defensive wars, Hamza died. And by the way, Muhammad forgave his killer. And that's something which, which goes against the warlord thesis. Because when he then conquered Mecca, when he conquered Mecca, he was actually no fighting. I'm not sure if you know this. It's called Fatha Mecca. When he went into and conquered Mecca, he didn't fight anybody. It was no fighting. There were a few people that, that were exempted, but he actually quoted what Joseph quoted to his brothers in the Quran, uh, in the Quran which is letter three by alaykum al that no blame is on you today. And so, and this, by the way, is a bedrock example of forgiveness in Islam because these were people that were persecuting him for 13 years. Um, again, more uh, cherry picking and false conclusions from uh, hijab. First, Wahshi, the guy he was talking about, uh, became a Muslim after the conquest of Mecca. Why? Why would Muhammad kill him? Why? He'd be uh, stupid if he did that. Secondly, Wahshi is not the only one who killed Muslims and then became Muslim. Khalid ibn walid for example, did the same. Now, let's talk about the so-called peaceful conquest of Mecca. What Hijab didn't mention is that at the time, the Muslims were a strong power. Most of the people in Mecca surrendered. This is the reason for the peaceful uh, uh, conquest of the city. Nevertheless, there was some resistance which was immediately crushed. Muhammad also had a list of people uh, he wanted dead. He said, kill them even if you find them clinging to the covers of Kaaba. Hijab tries to make us believe that forgiveness is the basis for dealing with enemies in Islam. But he knows very well that this is not the case. One example of many is the rich Jewish poet Kab ibn al-Ashraf, who uh, allegedly attacked the Prophet and Muslims uh, through his poetry. What did the Prophet do to him? He sent people to kill him, and they did. Another example is mentioned in this authentic hadith. Ikrima reported on the authority of Ibn Abbas that a blind man had a slave mother who used to abuse the Prophet and disparage him. All that according to the blind man, by the way. He forbade her, but she did not stop. He rebuked her, but she did not give up her habit. One night, she began to slander the prophet and abuse him. So he took a dagger, placed it on her belly, pressed it hard until it killed her. When the morning came, the prophet was informed about it. He assembled the people and said, I adjure by Allah the man who has done this action, and I adjure him by my right to him that he should stand up. Jumping over the necks of the people and trembling, the man stood up. He sat before the Prophet and said, Apostle of Allah, I am her master. She used to abuse you and disparage you. I forbade her, but she did not stop, and I rebuked her. But she did not abandon her habit. I have two sons like pearls from her. And she was my companion. Last night, she began to abuse and disparage you. So I took a dagger, put it on her belly, and pressed it till I killed her. Thereupon the Prophet said, O oh, bear witness, no retaliation is payable for her blood. But... Perhaps the, the clearest example of what forgiveness looks like in Islam is what 
Muhammad did to the Jewish tribe of Bani Quraida. Perhaps you have already heard of the massacre. After the battle of Al-Khandaq, Muhammad and his companions besieged the tribe of Bani Quraida until they surrendered. What happened after that is the horror movie. All men plus all pubescent boys were decapitated and the women and children were enslaved. Now, if you compare this, because I think the comparison, if there's any comparison that can be or should be made, it's, the, it's Jesus' second coming with Muhammad in the Medinan period, not in the Meccan period. In the Meccan period, both were being persecuted, Jesus in his life and Muhammad in, his, in the Meccan period. But Jesus, when he comes back, he will then get authority and he will, be, uh, he will be ruling with the iron scepter, according to the Bible. He will be crushing his, uh, he will be crushing his enemies, uh, as it says in Corinthians, under his foot, humbling his enemies under his foot uh, and killing and violent stuff. So, in fact, what the, the, I, I will actually argue today that the New Testament representation of Jesus Christ in his second coming is way more violent than Muhammad's conquests in uh, the Medinan period. Okay. I don't want to comment here necessarily. I just find it very funny, at least for me as an atheist, uh, to compare historical figures with fictional ones. Okay, well, There's... look, like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to make the case. I wasn't trying to make the case that what happened in Mecca or Medina was wrong. Like, so let me explain that a little bit. So Christian Europe fought a defensive war against the Nazis, it isn't obvious that that was wrong. I don't think that was... I, but, I wouldn't say that's defensive. Well, uh, okay, fine. But, but I understand the concept of defensive war. And, well, America and, didn't... Uh, America, when America got involved in World War II, it was not under immediate threat by Germany. And they colonized it. And here's the thing. It, col it, it, it overtook Western Germany, you see. And when it, uh, the, here's the thing. The term warlord that you use with the prophet, you've never used with Harry Truman. You've never used with, uh, with, with uh, Roosevelt. You've never used with Winston Churchill, all of which conquered countries, literally, in wars. Because I feel like there is, there is a bias there. And you've actually never used it with anybody else, aside from the Prophet Muhammad in your public output. And I think that's unjustifiable. I think that you have biblical prophets like Moses. You have biblical prophets like um, Joshua. You have, you have the, uh, Jesus in his second coming, all of which were warrior prophets. And, 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 and you've only used the term uh, war, uh, warlord with the Prophet Muhammad. And I think that is unjustifiable. I think. So obviously, uh, Hijab is not pleased with Jordan Peterson calling Muhammad a warlord. Um, before we talk about that, I, I, I don't know if you noticed how Jordan Peterson talked about Christian Europe and Hijab mentions the USA as an example. Hijab accuses um, Peterson of, of, of two things here. First, that he calls Muhammad a warlord, and second, that he calls only Muhammad a warlord, and, and, and not the others, like uh, Roosevelt or Churchill or uh, Moses uh, and other warrior prophets. What is the definition of warlord? According to the Oxford Dictionary, a warlord is a military commander, an aggressive regional commander with individual autonomy. Was Muhammad a military leader? Yes. Was he aggressive and with individual autonomy? Yes. So by definition, Muhammad was a warlord. But it must be said that he was not like that all his life. The first 13 years in Mecca, Muslims were, were weak. They didn't have an army. They, didn't, they, they couldn't fight. Only after the Hijra, the migration to Medina, and the uh, foundation of the Islamic State, all the caravan raids and, and, and expeditions began. Well, you know, in, okay, in the so fine. You pushed back on me, so I'll push back on you to some okay. degree. Okay. Well, it's certainly the case that the expansion of the Islamic Empire was ac accomplished by a tremendous amount of warlike activity, and that wasn't defensive. 
Now, look, I understand that monotheism is a, a difficult state to attain, yeah. and that monotheistic societies have emerged in the midst of conflict throughout human society. I understand that, and I'm not even saying that there's something exceptional in that regard about Islam, although the rate at which it happened was quite remarkable. But it still it presents us with a problem, doesn't it? I mean, everyone. It presents everyone with a problem. And the problem is, well, for example, the problem is reconciling the idea of turning the other cheek with the idea of a just war, a defensive war, or an expansive war for that matter. And of course that issue is relevant to Islam because Islam exploded outward and produced the biggest empire the world had ever seen in, in, the, in the space of a few short centuries. Yeah, but so, Dr. Jordan and so the, yeah, yeah, so then, well, so then you, you ask, well, what's the spirit, what is the spirit that animated that? And is that attributable to okay. the, the Islamic doctrines themselves? Yes, I don't know the be. answer to that. Now, let me tell you the answer to that, okay? Brother asked a very good question. Um, I'm glad that Jordan Peterson insisted that uh, hijab say something about Islamic expansion. Uh, Peterson is right. No matter how, how many times Muslims claim that uh, Muslim wars were defensive, the facts paint a different picture. Let us now hear what hijab has to say about this. And this is what I want to tell you conclusively, and this will help build bridges, honestly, because we can maintain the warlord thesis, we can maintain the expansionist thesis. But here's what I'll tell you. Islam has a, has a capability to be expansive, and it also has a capability of making peace treaties. And it does, and it should do whatever's in its best interest, just like every country should do whatever's in its best interest. What hijab says here is true, but vague. He does not explain what he means exactly. In Islam, the Imam, the leader of Muslims, can make peace treaties, yes. But here's the rub. The goal for Muslims is always to bring the whole world under Islamic rule. Of course, this is not always feasible. Sometimes you are just too weak or uh, you need more time to prepare, mobilize. In such cases, peace treaties can be made, but they should be temporary. Hijab wants us to believe that it, this is normal. Um, each country should do what, what is good for its interest, but that's not always okay. We have the UN. We have international laws. The USA, for example, cannot just conquer Canada and Mexico, because they can. But ask yourself this question. What would stop Muslims from conquering other countries if they had the strength of the USA? If you're honest, you'd answer nothing. In the pre-modern world, we did not... I think this is highly anachronistic. In the pre-modern world, there was no such thing as the UN. It was a realist international relations framework whereby everybody was fighting everyone. Uh, the Roman Empire didn't care about what, what you, it didn't care about you, quite frankly. It was expanding itself. The Persian Empire was expanding itself. You know, sometimes you think you have a good argument, but it turns out you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. That's what happened here. Um, to justify the, the offensive jihad that uh, Hijab still hasn't named, uh, Hijab tells us that at the time it was okay because there was no UN and everyone was doing it. So hijab knows that Muslims have conquered large areas through offensive jihad. This offensive jihad, according to him, is acceptable or was acceptable at the time because everyone was doing it. Three problems arise. Problem number one, offensive jihad is bad. The fact that others have also waged offensive jihad, offensive wars, does not make offensive jihad better. Problem number two, offensive jihad has not ended. It is not dependent on time and space. The only reason it does not exist today, apart from, from what ISIS uh, has done, is because Muslims are weak. Problem number three, this here is about a religion, not about any uh, old political systems. 
Muslims believe that the orders for, for offensive jihad came from God, from Allah. You cannot compare the actions of Muslims with those of uh, Romans and, and, and others. The motives are different. I see that the expansion of the Islamic empire is a proof of Islam. And you know, it's not just me. Even historians say this. How Barnaby Rogerson, he said the fact that Islam spread to the Roman empire and the Persian empire is equivalent to, the, 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 is, is equivalent to Eskimos taking over Russia and America. I believe it's miraculous, if anything, that this happened. But I don't think it's unjustifiable. I think actually Jordan Peterson, to be then completely why honest did it with you, stop at, Why did it stop at Europe's borders, so to speak? If it was a well, miraculous it expansion. Yeah, it stopped out because of, uh, the, it wasn't successful there. It wasn't, it, it stopped where it, 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 it couldn't go further. Exactly. The, the miracles of God have stopped. Um, what Hijab says here is funny, but was to be expected. When trying to defend their faith, uh, Muslims always tend to, to find uh, or, or create miracles in, in all sensitive issues. According to Hijab's logic, uh, the German Blitzkrieg was a miracle. The, the achievements of Alexander the Great were a miracle. The, the triumphs of uh, Genghis Khan were a miracle. The arguments are extremely complicated. You're absolutely right. And I think what's really important here, because I think this is a huge misconception, is to, to outline, because I know you're against totalitarianism. You're very uh, you know, vocal about that. And I want to tell you that we are also a point of commonality. We are also against totalitarianism. If we, if we define totalitarianism as um, a central government trying to encroach every private and public matter uh, of, of the citizens' lives. And this is something we don't believe in. In fact, this is very important. Islam does not say you have to force people either to become Muslim or that they can, or they have to live an Islamic lifestyle within an Islamic governance. And I'm not sure if you know this, but at the time of the Prophet, he made a constitution okay, with Jewish people, with other people who are not Muslim at the time, protecting their rights, protecting their rights to worship whoever they wanted to worship. And actually even guaranteeing that if there were intruder forces, that they would be protected like that as well. Is that, and, the, is that the arrangement made with like fellow people of the book, essentially? Yes, it, it was the arrangement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, made I'm aware of that. Yes, and so not only this, but this was implemented at the time of the caliphs. So Omar, Omar al Khattab, or um, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and so on. This is, we believe in a kind of pluralism in this sense. And in fact, this is, I would argue that it was more legally efficacious than what we have in the West. Do you know why? Because permission was... Do you was think that's true now? Yes, even, let me tell you why. Because Christians were given courts that they could rule in and that the law would be efficacious, it would be a parallel dissenting law system which would have effect. So they would, so they would effectively be able to go and judge their affairs outside of the, the general framework of Islam. The, and, and in fact, this is in the Quran. And, and, and they took this, even though we believe that the Torah has been corrupted to some extent, uh, the, the, the remnants of, they can use the Torah, whatever corrupted version they have, to rule their affairs. And this is something that was, was, was done at the time of the Prophet, done, done at the time of the Caliphs. Hijab is trying here to prettify the concept of Ahl al Dimma. Um, in Islam, Ahl al Dimma are non Muslim citizens who live with the Muslims in Dar al Islam, in the land of Islam, who pay the jizya, the tribute, and submit to the Islamic rules in uh, other than what they have in terms of the rules of beliefs, worships, uh, marriage, divorce, food stuff, and dress. Ahl al-Dimma could keep their faith, uh, marry and divorce, and eat and drink according to their religious rules. For example, they, uh, they, they can eat pork, uh, can drink and can can drink wine. This all sounds pretty good, but there's a darker truth that no one wants to talk about. What are the obligations of Ahl al dimma To answer this question, I will quote the same scholar who was quoted by Hijab earlier, Ibn al-Qayyim, one of the 
most famous scholars in Islamic history. His book, The Ruling of uh, Ahl al-Dimma, Ahkam Ahl al-Dimma, contains all the details about the rights and obligations of Ahl al-Dimma. I want you to pause the video and read this by yourself. Ibn Qudama, also a famous scholar, lists in his book Al-Mughni Al the obligations of Ahl al-Dimma. One, commitment to the jizya and the application of the ahkam, uh, rules or ruling of the people of Islam upon them. Number two, to leave what which is harmful to the Muslims and their property like aggressing uh, against the Muslims by striking or looting. Number three, to avoid that which is derogatory against the Muslims like making remarks about Islam, the Quran, or the messenger in an improper manner. Number four, to avoid displaying that which is a munkar, like drinking alcohol in public places of the Muslims. Number five, distinguishing themselves from the Muslims with a specific sign that they are recognized by, which could be in their clothing or something else. And so even now we would say, and I'm not saying that the whole of Islamic history has presented this convivencia that we saw in Spain between Muslims, Christians, and Jews at a good time and, and uh, or, or a other times time in India. By all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not saying that, of course I'm not. But what I'm saying is that I think it is disingenuous to, to, to paint a point uh, Islam as if it's been the most intolerant of all of these religions. Look at the Alhambra, look at the uh, Spanish Inquisition, look at the Crusades, look at, look at the colonialism that has happened in the name, if not, even, not in the name of religion. This is a good example of a uh, uh, U2 logical fallacy. I kind of think, well, let he who can tell the best story win. And then that story also has the best actors, so to speak, right? And so I would say the proper mode to conversion is something like shining example. And then if you're governed by a doctrine that is in fact divine, and you're managing to embody that in the sense that gives you the glow, the charismatic glow of embodied divinity, two steps removed, let's say, and people are willing to abide by your words as a consequence, well, more power to you. And that's a lot more efficient and effective than compulsory war, or armed conflict, or any of those things. And I mean, this is a constant problem. And I would also say that given our technological mastery now, we really can't afford this anymore. We have to solve this problem of defensive war, expansive war, evangelical religion, you know, how to go about you not how to go about uniting us under some umbrella that isn't so vague that it means nothing, how to preserve our traditions from the past. And I can't see any better way than each of us trying to be shining exemplars of our tradition and then letting that goodness shine forth in a way that people, you may, you may, it may be the case that we'll find that the better we are, the more we're like each other. I mean, wouldn't that be a kind of union under something approximating God that all good men could see in each other a reflection of something that was the highest? And yeah, that that should be compelling in and of itself? This is by far my favorite intervention by uh, Jordan Peterson. Absolutely. But I think in terms of the jurisprudence, in terms of what Islam is capable of, people in the West must realize that Islam is fully capable of peace. This is what must be realized. How do we, how do we know that? It's not despite the Quran and the Sunnah or the sayings of the Prophet and the actions, but it's because of them. That is simply not true. And, and, and Hijab knows it. He knows that permanent peace is only achievable uh, when Islam uh, prevails, dominates, and uh, the, the non-Muslim pay tribute. As long as this is not the case, peace can, can, can only be imposed uh, and, and, and can only be temporary. Ibn Taymiyyah, um, one of the greatest, if, if not the greatest scholar in Islam, um, wrote the following in, in his book, uh, Fiqh al-Jihad. Anyone whom the call of the messenger, peace be upon him, has reached, but refused to accept, must be fought. If you, if you look at the Quran and you look at, for example, chapter four, verse 90, uh, or if you look at, for example, 
chapter one verse ninety, uh, chapter two verse one ninety, one ninety, you'll see that the the um, the Islamic commandments are clearly sometimes about defensiveness, but sometimes also clearly about um, about creating peace treaties. And this, to understand what hijab is doing here, one must first know that jihad in Islam had several development stages. In the first stage, when the Muslims were, uh, for the most part, still in Mecca, they were, like I said before, weak. They could not fight. The part of the Quran that was written in Mecca was quite peaceful. Then came the second stage, uh, after the migration to Medina, where jihad was allowed, but not prescribed. Then the third stage, Muslims were then commanded to fight, but only against people who fight them, so against attackers. And the fourth and final stage is the stage of offensive jihad against all infidels. That's the last and final stage. Now, in, in each of these four stages, a part of the Quran was written. Peaceful stage, one would, of course, find peaceful verses. In the last stage, on the other hand, one would find the most aggressive verses. So, to hide this fact, this development, these stages, Muslims, like hijab, quote only the Quranic verses that were written in the first stages. To illustrate this, I'm going to show you examples from the Quran to see the development of jihad stages. First verse, have you, O Prophet, not seen those who had been told, do not fight, rather establish prayer and pay alms tax? Then once the order came to fight, a group of them feared those hostile people as Allah should be feared or even more. Then we have verse number two. Permission to fight back is hereby granted to those being fought, for they have been wronged, and Allah is truly most capable and of helping them prevail. Here you see this is the authorization to fight, but not the order to fight, it's just the permission to fight. Then we go to the third stage. Fight in the way of Allah those who fight against you, but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. And this, by the way, is uh, the verse that, that Hijab quoted. So this is not the last stage. This is still stage number three. So in order to fight those who uh, fight against uh, Muslims. And here, the last and final stage of jihad. Fight against those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful and who do not adopt the religion of truth, Islam, uh, from those who were given the scripture. Fight until they give the jizya willingly while they they are humbled. And it's, I, I, don't, I still don't see how Islamic countries, there's like almost 50 Muslim majority countries, uh, in like in general, like you made a point about economic uh, potential one time. You said that. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because, well, that's another thing that's quite a mystery is that the comparatively speaking per capita, the Muslim countries are not that productive economically. That's that's a, there's four Muslim majority in, in countries. In what sense? Which are, there's four Muslim, there are four out of 10 Muslim majority countries in the GDP per capita top 10. Brunei, Qatar, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. Well, yeah, well, I'm not sure that I'm willing to grant the fact that most of that wealth is generated by oil as a as a no, no, indicator fine, of productivity. Still, the, the point stands is per, you said per capita GDP. Per yeah, capita. but that sorry, yes, fair enough, and you yeah. were right to call me on that. That isn't what that isn't what I meant. I'm yeah. sorry That's because fine, don't I don't be. think I. Well, yeah. no, I do. I, we yeah. got to get the words right here. We got to get them exactly right because these things matter. Um, I don't the well. All you know that oil wealth is often a curse as well as a blessing. 
So yeah. outside of oil wealth. You have Brunei. Brunei is another country that's in the top 10. Um, which okay, is so let's talk country. about Brunei. What have they done right in, in your estimation? I don't know much about Brunei, but I know they're in the top 10. I have to be honest with you. you know, but yeah, well, I, that's part of this low resolution knowledge that we all have a problem with, right? I mean, it's yes. talk, talking about these things is very difficult because you have to know everything to do it yeah, right. I've, it's not that easy I've, to know yeah. everything. I know that they were trying to implement Sharia to a very high uh, level. And... Uh, whatever they're doing is, is not because it's not despite the Sharia. I really have no idea what hijab is trying to achieve here. As uh, Jordan Peterson correctly pointed out, the Islamic countries that have high GDP per capita are oil rich countries. And yes, Brunei too. Here is a, a map from uh, the IMF. As you can see, the Islamic countries are pretty much all in, in the low range of uh, GDP per capita. Exceptions are the oil-rich countries like uh, Qatar, uh, the United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia. And I think we've actually come quite a long way in being able to build bridges. To summarize, really, from my side, so long as today we have realized that, okay, Islam is a religion not too dissimilar, okay, from the other previous dispensations, as we would, we would see it, and that there are things, there's a flesh that joins these religions. And also that peace is possible. Peace is good. possible. Well, then let's, let's yeah. see if we can be good enough people to actually want peace. Let's try and see what we can do. I don't think I can agree with the summary of Mr. Hijab. To build bridges, one would have to be honest, transparent, and self-critical. I don't think hijab was that in this conversation with Jordan Pete. Thank you for uh, putting up with me uh, until here and uh, see you again. Bye.